Hi everyone, so I'm in uh, Parma in Italy. Uh, Parma is in the Po Valley in Italy between Milan and Bologna. And I'm at the Picasso Food Forest, which is the first public food forest in Italy. Pretty great achievement for the group behind this. And I'm gonna be talking with one of the founders of Picasso, Francesca. Riolo. Um, so let's uh, let's find Francesca and have a chat. So hello, Francesca. Uh, um, so Francesca is one of the founders of the Picasso Food Forest. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to ask you, Francesca, about who you are and how the project started. Yes. Yep. Um, I'm Francesca Riolo, I'm an activist of the Parma Sostenibile NGO that is currently managing this project. The project actually is older than the NGO. It was started in 2012, the 23rd December of 2012, when for the first time we started planting some of the trees that you see in the area currently. Yep. And uh, it was started by an informal group of citizens that became aware of all the big challenges that our society was going through, yep. uh, environmentally, but also socially wise. Mm. And we thought to start from food. Uh, why from food? Because food, of course, is common to everybody. Everybody needs to eat. But yep. uh, as we start to learn, also food is uh, the main impact factor of men on our planet. Mm. Uh, and we wanted to create a place within a, a residential neighborhood where mm. people could come out and talk about these challenges, and but also uh, experiment something practical. Yep. Um, they could help face them and maybe one day overcome them. <laughs> yeah, yes. And, and my understanding is um, the Picasso Food Forest is the first public food forest in Italy that's not... Yes, people are aware uh, of that we know that we know, that we know yeah. yes and a uh, well-documented case yeah uh, and indeed uh, it's very important to point out that it's a public food forest and also that you can see is not a fenced area no so it remains a public area accessible 24 hours a day and anybody can come in and uh, enjoy what the area is uh, offering and also harvesting what here is produced yeah, and that, and that comes with sort of um, interesting challenges, doesn't it? You know, people just coming in and randomly picking fruit off trees and maybe damaging trees. And, um, and you know, I guess some core volunteers eyeing off certain fruits and then they don't get to take them because someone else comes along and takes them. And, yeah, that's yes. a very common uh, uh, worry about people uh, yeah. when they first hear about this approach to the project. But I think it's also it's a major... Uh, I'd say strong point uh, because it's really important that first of all, if we are doing something on a public area, that this area uh, keeps remaining public. Yeah. Because it's very important the sharing uh, concept. And uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And also, this allows people to get in touch with what we want to communicate and create. So it's a really fundamental aspect: the possibility for citizens to get into this place, feel connected to nature yep. in the middle of the city and see what we are experimenting. So this new sustainable uh, way of uh, producing our food that is through agroforestry, and extreme agroforestry, of course, because we are doing here food forestry. Yes, yes, exactly. All right, um, do you want to show me the, the really great sign yes. that you've got here? Um, yes, indeed. For us, uh, communicating also when we are not present in the area is very important. We installed the over 35 information panels. This is the first panel that you see when you come in from one of the first main access points. As you can see here, benvenuti, it means welcome in Italian. Yeah, yeah. Uh, here we describe a little bit the aim of the project. Uh, all the, um, we created a path with information panel that you can go through that um, address some technical aspect of the project, but also some more general uh, environmental issues. Um, the area, as you can see, is L-shaped. It's about half an hectare. And... Yep. Uh, cultivated uh, based on the food forest model, but it also hosts other uh, components. Uh, one of the aim of the project was also to create an outdoor educational area. So we created okay. the 
what we call educational stations, where we um, address in depth some specific aspects of ecosystem functionings that are also the base of a food forest ecosystem functioning. Yep. So we have, for example, um, areas that address the importance of biodiversity, including animal biodiversity for the balance between prey and predator, of course. Yep. Uh, areas that address the importance of uh, soil health, so the role of uh, the soil ecosystem in the offering... Comp the compost edgio. Yes, also composting. So yep. how can we recycle our uh, organic waste and make very useful humus yep. uh, to be introduced in, in our vegetable system? Um, we will um, um, also have tables, of course, to socialize and, and, and create areas where people can relax and uh, read and also do other stuff. And as you can see here at the bottom, you have a series of green signs. You don't see any red forbidden uh, In, signs yes, on, this, uh, on these panels. Yes, there's no, uh, there's no signs of a, a little uh, slash going uh, through. No, indeed. Through it. Yeah. That's because we wanted to inspire people to do positive things in the area yeah, rather cool. than... Uh, uh, a really positive uh, the, message. Yes, yes. So, uh, and also uh, highlighting that uh, here we are not just growing food, we are offering a multifunctional area where you can do many different things. From yes. Observing nature, participating in the cultivation and care of the area, harvesting and tasting fruits, um, relax, read, take your kids to explore nature, do physical activities, yeah, take I your dog it. for a walk. Yeah, it's cool, isn't it? Uh, yes, and meet people, of course, also. Yeah. I love the, uh, the the symbols. Yeah, it sort of tells the story instantly. Yeah, and I do I do really like the all the signs mm -hmm. around here. And we'll we'll have a look at them as we go go through. Yeah. Okay. Great. Thanks for that. Um, all right. Do you want to go for a little walk? Yes. Sure. Yeah. Fantastic. What's been happening recently? Um, perhaps it's probably not a bad place to start. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Um... Well, as I was mentioning before, we have here some uh, educational station, and yep. right here at the entrance, we have one dedicated to the butterfly garden. Butterfly so garden. Of course, this is a subject yeah. that attracts a lot of kids, and yeah. uh, it's also very fascinating. Yeah. We are aware of uh, butterflies have a very fascinating uh, life cycle. Yeah. Uh, for Fali, that's the. Uh, the word for butterfly. That's the term for yes, butterfly. Indeed. Yep. And we explain how it is important to provide habitats, not just for one life stage of the insects, but for all different life stages that can have different needs. A classic example are butterfly, where uh, while the adult feeds on nectar, so it requires a plants with, uh, with uh, nice flowers, the caterpillar stage uh, yeah. feeds directly on plants in most of the, of the, for most of species. And thus it's very important to provide plants that uh, function as nursery plants for the caterpillar stage. Yeah. So what are we? In this area we so, did um, introduce several types of plants that are particularly useful to the, this purpose. Uh, in our area we have a very um, uh, rare butterfly that is called Zerinthia, and whose caterpillar feeds on only one specific plant. Oh. So if that plant is not there, of course, the butterfly is not going to be there. Yep. And we are trying to introduce this plant, it's called Aristolochia rotunda, yep. that you cannot see in this time of the year because it's a very early plant developing in, uh, in spring. Okay. Uh, as you can see, indeed, uh, now we are in autumn and the vegetation layer is not uh, very rich, but this is uh, linked uh, to natural cycles, but also to the droughts uh, yes. that we are having during summers. Yes. Unfortunately, it's, of course, creating uh, some problem in managing uh, our vegetation layers. Yeah. Um, it's very challenging. So, but, so my understanding is uh, Italy, like um, many places in the Northern Hemisphere, and uh, Europe included, had extreme drought this this year yes, in 2022. Uh, not only this, this year was definitely one of uh, um, a major one, but also previous years uh, the dry period has been much much longer than used to be in the past. Yeah. So yep. this really is changing yep. uh, a lot for the vegetation and also for people that are trying to uh, manage this kind of uh, project. Yeah, and and I guess for a, a food forest, and this part of the food forest is is 10 years old. Um, this is a good, you know, in some ways it's a good stress test mm -hmm. to see how it performs in yes. extreme indeed, indeed. temperatures, yeah. Um, this is also our type of approach. We have to see which plants work yes. well in our condition, in our changing conditions, and select those that uh, are better adapter mm. without uh, necessarily 
uh, trying hard with artificial methods to keep the plants maybe alive, you know, for maybe see a, a plant that is not doing well, yep. catching diseases, yep. and uh, starts using uh, pesticides or chemi chemical uh, substances. Uh, we have different approach. If we see the plants is not adapted, is not doing well in our area climate and conditions, then we maybe replace it with something that's more suitable. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's right. It's sort of trial and error. See what works. Yes, hoping that something will be left at the end. Yeah. Because unfortunately, definitely, uh, nature was not adapted to such a, a quick change as we are now yeah. generating with uh, man-made uh, anthropogenic, what is anthropogenic uh, CO2 emissions. Yeah. So, yeah, the climate change. Yeah. 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 But, and so some of the plants that we've got here. What have what have we got? Yes. Um, this one is one that was meant to uh, be a nursery plant for the famous uh, cabbage uh, uh, butterfly. Oh, okay. So, yes, and this is also a perennial cabbage, so we don't need to replant it every every year. Yep. And it's also a uh, good edible for, for people, so, so we have uh, this double function. Uh, then you cannot see the um, uh, wild fennel, that is the uh, main nursery plant for another beautiful uh, butterfly. Uh -huh. uh, that is the macaone, called in, Italiano, uh, in Italian. Papilio yeah. Macaon, a very beautiful uh, actual caterpillar that you can see on the picture here. Yeah. So this is the, the butterfly. You can oh. see here it's actually laying eggs on the wild fennel. And this is the beautiful, almost tropical looking, uh, you know, caterpillar. Yeah, isn't it interesting? So fennel, you know, um, I think many people in Australia would be familiar with that plant. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but, but I don't think there'd be too many people who would recognise fennel as... In its native country, Italy, as a as a butterfly plant. Yes, um, yes, so that that's really, to me, that's really fascinating. Yeah, cool. All right. Um, shall we continue? Yeah, sure. Let's keep going. There's still plenty of uh, yeah station and things to explore and see. Yep. All right. Let's just uh, continue to walk through more signage here. Yes, this is just talking about um, what is a food. What is a food forest? Is that what this is? Yes, exactly. Saying? Of course, the, not everybody knows what a food forest no. is. So this is a sign to tell the, the story. basic principles be, behind it. Yep. Yeah, fantastic. So the fact that we are we are trying to cultivate food while imitating the functioning of a young woodland, and then you can see that uh, also the structure we created is similar to a woodland with plants of different uh, heights, uh, very high biodiversity. Uh, yeah, and I love how in this young forest, only 10 years old, it already starts to feel like a pleasant place to be in. Yes. You know, this is, if people can imagine, this just used to be grass Yes. in here, didn't it? Indeed, here there was just a mm. plain uh, over uh grass yep. where nothing really was happening, very low biodiversity, people were not really using the area and, yep. and so animals. And now it's... a uh, Highly biodiverse, two-dimensional system. Absolutely, yeah. This more of this fennel. Uh, yes. Growing in there, yep. I can see yep. that. Yeah. And you know, um, for many people who who might be a little bit more um, sensitive or um, attracted to formal gardening, this might seem quite messy. But this is biodiversity. Yes, indeed. We are also trying to value um, spontaneous plants, volunteering plants. Volunteer plants, volunteering yeah. Volunteering plants, uh, because they create indeed habitats that provide food, that provide shelter, and even um, dry plants at the end of their um, vegetation cycle are very important because they, they indeed provide food for birds, for example, through the seeds or yep. uh, shelter during the winter through their uh, dried part. So, so normally, that. Yeah, so, so there's a classic example yes, there, isn't yes, it? That's, so that's a thistle that's um, that's gone to seed. Yes, indeed. That's, and uh, inside here you have plenty of seeds that are going to become food for the birds in the winter. And yeah, yeah. So very important aspect. And birds then will help us uh, keep pest, the ecosystem functioning. Yeah, pest control for your um, for your plants. So for your um, fruits that are coming up. Yes. Fantastic. All right. Shall we keep keep going? Um, well, we don't even have to, have to go too far. This is a really interesting plant that I've sort of been getting to know in the last couple of days. This is, a, this is an Eliagnus, isn't it? Yes, Eliagnus uh, umbellata, autumn olive. The autumn olive, yes, yeah. Yes, it's a 
functional that we like a lot because it's um, many functions. First, the main one is, of course, to be a nitrogen fixer. So it has the ability to okay. uh, make a um, symbiotic relationship at the root level with bacteria that fix uh, nitrogen from the air and make it available in the soil. Yep. So it functions as a natural fertilizer. But as you can see, it's also very vigorous. Uh, it handles well the droughts and the mm. freezing in winter, and it's very productive. These Massively little productive. red uh, berries are really tasty and healthy for us and also for the birds that can enjoy it at the beginning of the winter. Yeah. Yeah, what a great plant. And it's, because it gets up so quickly, it's providing shade fairly quickly to the understory. And I can see there's some more beet. shade loving plants. Mm -hmm, that's, in a there. Beet. that's one of the beets, yeah. is it? Yeah. Yep. And what we've got in here, our current. Uh, in the back there, that one is a officinal plant, is a um, cardiaca. Cardiaca. Yeah. Oh, it's the Latin, uh, Latin. It's an, another, another edible plant that I don't know. And behind um, it, you see some asparagus growing. Yeah. Yeah. And that surprises me, asparagus doing well in a semi shaded sort of area. Um, yeah, but you've got that sort of layering of the design, haven't you? It's like, you know. Mm -hmm. You got you got sort of three layers in there, so Indeed. technically it's a food forest. Yeah, <laughs> we have all the layers. Yeah. Happening here. Yeah, nice. All right, let's let's keep on keep on moving through. Yeah, I love I love early Agnes. I've just been getting quite um, taken by it uh, recently, and mm -hmm. well, from yesterday really. Um, oh, I love it. Mm. Yeah, you see some uh, volunteering uh, borago. Porridge. Yeah, porridge. Yep, yep. Uh, so you can eat the leaves or use the beautiful flowers in the salad. You have yep. two seasons for the porridge. You have a, a big production in, in the spring and then again in the autumn. Okay. Of course, uh, you need to uh, consume it with moderation because uh, uh, it contains uh, some toxic substances. Yeah. That can be consumed at a high amount. Yes, yes. And here we have artichoke, I think. Uh, this is cardoons. This is this cardoons. is cardoons. Same species, different varieties. Yeah, so okay. In the artichokes, we selected a, a plant that have a big blossom. That is then the artichoke that we normally eat. Yes. In cardoons, the plant was selected to have a nice uh, leaf stock that you can uh, then um, clean and eat like yeah, a, yeah. a vegetable. Yeah. So you would harvest the leaf, take off the green bits, and eat the stalk, a bit like a celery. Exactly. Um, yes. And and. Cardoon is uniquely an Italian um, uh, plant. It's, it's used a lot in Italian um, uh, cooking. Especially in some specific regions. Yes. yes yeah. Like uh, Piedmont is uh, particularly uh, uh, known to, to use this, this to plant. Use, to use it. As you can see, it's also uh, an additional uh, aspect. It's very beautiful and uh, yes. rich uh, flowering. Uh, uh, Yes, then it's also then useful in um, in winter again because you can see these flowers provide shelter and food. Yeah, and I guess these really animals. spectacular um, purple um, flowers, flowers indeed, isn't it? Indeed. Absolutely amazing. Yeah, uh, and I think yesterday, Francesca, you were saying that that there would be um, insects living in these mm -hmm. dry uh, flower heads, so it's habitat. Yes, very um, important habitats because, of course, uh, insects to be there next year need to survive the winter yes. without food at a very low temperature in our climate, and they need shelter. Yeah, so uh, it's important not to cut that down. Uh, yes, or at least to leave it around in your garden. Okay. So even a composting would be, for example. Oh, so even if you cut it, just lay it down into the garden or yeah. into your compost. Yes, indeed. Uh, uh, in our uh, highly manicured urban spaces, often we are eliminating. Yeah. Food and shelter for biodiversity. Uh, yeah, that's right. So it is an aspect we are really trying to communicate to people that come here. Mm. Yeah, great. All right. Uh, let's let's continue. Uh, I know. Uh